everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, over the next 25, 30 minutes, I'll be talking about the COVID-19 vaccines in patients with end-stage kidney disease, specifically ones on maintenance dialysis and ones with a functioning kidney transplant. I will discuss clinical trials, allocation priorities, and assessment immunogenicity in this patient population. These are my uh, disclosures, just to let everybody know. Uh, this is a slide that I've shown about a couple of months ago during an American Society of Nephrology webinar about the COVID numbers and COVID vaccine research. At that time, uh, when you do a, a web search, you would be able to find about 230 plus uh, registered vaccine trials. And uh, since then, we know that under the emergency use agreement, uh, there are already three uh, vaccines that are approved in the United States. Uh, and then there's one other vaccine that's already approved in uh, European Union, the AstraZeneca trial uh, related vaccine. There are a number of different vac uh, vaccine trials that are going on, which I'm not going to go into too much detail. And you already heard about the vaccines and their efficacy and their background with another speaker. So, but this is just to give you an idea of what's going on with the vaccine research in general. Now, uh, again, a very uh, short background. Uh, there are two messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccines that are authorized under the emergency use, uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna, which I will be referring them by their uh, pharmaceutical names for ease. Uh, both products demonstrated vaccine efficacy, that is to be able to prevent the moderate or severe disease over 90% of the general population. And that is demonstrated across all age groups, racial and ethnic groups. And then most recently, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a recombinant replication independent or incompetent adenovirus zero type 26 vector vaccine that is also approved under the uh, emergency authorization emergency use authorization. And then this vaccine's uh, efficacy is about 65% in general, with about 25% or so in the United States and 65% in Latin America. There's also data to suggest that it's about 50% or more effective in South Africa. Now, uh, our talk will be more uh, specific for the patients with kidney disease. Uh, the CDC back in 2019-2020, uh, and then subsequently, most recently in 2021, uh, recommended that vaccine may be administered to persons with underlying medical conditions who have no contraindications to vaccination. And again, this is a vaccination comment that is for all vaccines that are available to United, in the United States. It's not specific for COVID, but when we really look at it from the COVID vaccine perspective uh, related to patients with kidney disease, this is not completely applicable. Uh, they have said that the clinical trials demonstrate similar efficacy and safety in profiles with underlying, underlying medical conditions. And that's something that I'd like to discuss over the next 25 minutes or so. Again, a uh, short background. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but these are the two New England Journal of Medicine papers that are published about the Pfizer as well as the Moderna vaccines. I think the most important part that I'd like to highlight here is the fact that both vaccine trials have recruited a large really remarkable number of uh, participants in the study, in those studies. For example, on the left, when you look at the Pfizer trial, they were able to recruit about 45,000 plus patients. I wouldn't say patients, but individuals who have some kind of predisposition to get uh, the disease. And at the end of the study, when they really uh, provided their preliminary data or intermediate data to be able to get the vaccine authorization, there were about 37 patients that were evaluated. So it's a remarkable uh, and Hercules uh, uh, effort uh, from these individuals to be able to do the study. And the same is applicable for the Moderna trial. There were about 30,000 plus patients and at the end of the study, more than 28,000 of those patients were be able to give data to be able to get the information that they need for vaccine authorization or assessment of the vaccine efficacy. Uh, I'd just like to give you a little bit of information about the endpoints related to vaccine trials, the two mRNA-based trials, as well as the uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, adenovector-based uh, COVID-19 vaccine. On the top left, you see the primary endpoint for the Pfizer trial. And again, here, the efficacy is assessed by being able to prevent a moderate or severe disease in individuals who receive the vaccine. But the startup point in terms of when the disease happens is about 14 days after the second dose. And remember, uh, 
that Pfizer vaccine is given in three week intervals. After the first injection, after a three week interval, there's another infect injection. And then two weeks after that injection is the time when the actual assessment for primary outcome of the disease of the study is being assessed. Similarly, in the Moderna trial on the right side, top right side, you see the primary endpoints. Uh, it's again after 14 days after the second injection. But again, please remember the fact that uh, Moderna trial uh, administered the second dose four weeks after the initial vaccination. And then both trials have actually looked at two different outcomes. One is the efficacy of the vaccines against the severe disease that is causing hospitalization as well as death. And then in, in addition, Moderna trial looked at the efficacy of the vaccine after a single dose, which is the period between the first and the second vaccination. Now, both of these vaccines have actually been assessed in terms of their efficacy by event-based. So, so they said, we're going to look at the total number of events, total number of infections that happen after the second dosing. Whereas in the Johnson & Johnson trial, they've actually looked at the efficacy of the vaccine uh, at least seven days after the dose in participants without serological or biological evidence of uh, COVID infection that is happening at the 14th and the 28th days after the single dose. Now, they also looked at the severe uh, COVID uh, rates or incidents uh, as a secondary outcome uh, as compared to the uh, other two mRNA-based vaccine trials as well. Uh, for illustrative purposes, just wanted to show you the efficacy, the vaccine efficacy in terms of preventing the disease. These two slides, these two figures are almost identical to each other. And as you can see on the left side here, as shown in the larger figure, and on the right side as shown in these both figures over here, there is a significant or robust, very noticeable separation between the lines in terms of cumulative incidence of moderate or severe disease. The one in the blue shown as here is the placebo for the Pfizer vaccine. And then uh, here is the vaccine itself, pretty much completely averting all disease in this uh, individuals, in these individuals who receive the vaccine. And a similar effect as can be seen for the Moderna trial as you can be following here. The gray line is the placebo and the blue, blue is the vaccine itself. So these are very identical to each other in terms of an outstanding uh, prevention of actual severe and moderate disease hospitalizations and deaths. Now, most noticeably in these both trials, there were actually no deaths that were attributable to the uh, disease itself in the vaccine arms. So both medications, if you cannot combine them together in a total of 60 to 70,000 people over a period of two to three months, were able to completely prevent any deaths related to uh, COVID-19. I also would like to mention you two other things that are really important for our discussion over the next 10, 15 minutes. That is the efficacy after one dose only. This is the data from Moderna uh, document, and it shows the vaccine efficacy to prevent COVID-19 from dose one to the actual disease itself. And the part that I uh, underline here is the time between the first dose and the second dose. And as you can see here, there's about an 80% vaccine efficacy. That is 80% of the patients were actually being able to prevent it from the disease. But again, if you were to split this into two weeks in between the vac first vaccine and the second vaccine, that is 14 days after the first vaccine, the efficacy goes down to 50%. In other words, about 50% of the patients were actually prevented from getting a disease uh, after the first two weeks of the first uh, vaccine dosage. Now, after the second week, third and fourth weeks, actually, this was much more effective, up to 92%. And when you combine the two, you can see a substantial, a really robust efficacy in terms of an 80% as shown here. Similarly, you can see data that is shown for the Pfizer trial. And again, this is looking at the difference, not the difference, but the efficacy of the vaccine between the first and the second dose. And here I've under, underlined the total data. In the time between of three weeks between the two vaccines, there were 39 infections in the vaccine arm and there were 82 infections in the placebo arm. And if you look at these data, that actually uh, showed itself about a 50% vaccine efficacy. Now, again, if you split these three weeks into 
seven days after the dose or seven days before the dose, the efficacy actually went up substantially in terms of a 90% or so. So the data here clearly indicates that the first two weeks, the patients could be a little bit vulnerable after the first dose. And this is for healthy general population. And I'm showing you these data because it has important implications for the available data of vaccines in patients with kidney disease, especially ones with transplant, as well as the ones that are on dialysis. Now, do we have data from those large phase three trials in terms of patients with kidney disease? And unfortunately, the data are very limited. These are the only information that we have. This is a table two supplemental table two showing the baseline comorbidities in the Pfizer trial. And as you can see, there's a total of 256 patients that are actually included in these studies. And these patients have not been really phenotype or any granular data is available in terms of which renal disease we're looking at. So there's a very limited amount of data that can allow us to make any conclusions in terms of whether these vaccines are effective in terms of preventing disease, the COVID-19 disease in patients with kidney disease. And again, if you go back and look at the data, that was published in terms of the safety and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines in patients with kidney disease. This KI report that was published by Glenn and colleagues showed that CKD was explicitly excluded in many of the trials that were done, both phase one, phase two, phase three trials that have been available to us in terms of COVID-19 vaccines. If I can just show you here, only 6% of the trials have actually had a specific EGFR threshold of greater than 60%. And despite the fact that it was left to the investigator's discretion in terms of recruiting or not recruiting patients with kidney disease, as I've shown you, there's almost zero patients, only 256 out of 60,000 patients that were actually recruited in those studies that have been published to date. It's even worse for the patients who have transplants or have or receiving immunosuppression. In those patients, those were excluded from 86% of all trials. And in phase three trials, about 95% clearly excluded patients with immunocompromising conditions, which includes any patient that has a kidney transplant. So the data are not to be available or just the data that the style of the studies are such that we are not able to get any information up front from these studies that are available to us in terms of how to really understand what's going on with the patients with kidney disease. So what are the issues or questions that are ongoing regarding the vaccines in uh, patients with kidney disease? These are the things I'm gonna mention, and I'm gonna to touch them very quickly to give you some data at the end of the talk. What are the operational issues regarding the access to vaccines? Well, initially there was a huge concern in terms of when our patients, that is patients with kidney disease will have access uh, to the vaccines. And this is all, as you know, is very geographically dependent, uh, state dependent, as well as county dependent. But this is an example that we had in the uh, state of Tennessee. And when this whole process started back in uh, November or late November, early December, it was projected that uh, patients with kidney disease will receive the vaccine as a part of this high risk group, 1C, in March second quarter of uh, 2021. Now, this really created a huge concern amongst many other people because when they really did this 1C designation, they actually did not really specify who was priority in terms of having a severe illness. And this was the list of the patients that they said that would be suitable for 1C. And as you can see, they included patients with COPD, individuals who are obese or severely obese, or the ones who are smoking. And again, if you were just to look at the obese or severe obese, you will see that just having that designation actually includes 40% of the US population. Clearly there was concern among the uh, kidney community that doing this will create a huge competition in terms of whether our patients are gonna be able to get the vaccine versus the 40% of the whole entire United States population. And again, a lot of agencies, uh, societies as well as foundations made a plea to the government, to the CDC and other policymakers to include dialysis patients, a little bit more pri higher priority in terms of the high risk categories. And this is a list of things that ASN did. And I know that very well that NKF and other uh, entities have really worked hard to be able to push this a little bit earlier 
I would say we were both successful and not successful. The success happened by default. That is, the actual availability of vaccines have definitely exceeded what the expectations were. And early March 2021, now in most states, if not all, anyone over the age of 16 are eligible for vaccine. So by the time they people thought, at least the policymakers thought that we will be giving it to high risk people, we had so many vaccines available to us that we were able to give it to anyone. Now, unfortunately, what I would say is that this is not something that we should consider as a success. It is a relative success. It's great to have it to give it to our patients, but we could have obtained the vaccine or we should have obtained the vaccine to our patients earlier. And again, we all applaud ASN and KF, everybody else, the initiative to vaccinate the dialysis patients. And I think one of the most important steps that have been taken is the fact that the CDC have agreed to give enough vaccines to large dialysis organizations for mass vaccination. This is a very important step that needed to be taken from the very beginning. Now, there's also some issues that are really relevant to the dialysis unit, which I will not go into too much detail, but we know for a fact that not every patient in the dialysis unit wants to get vaccinated. And that is related to many different reasons. You know, it could be because of the denial, lack of knowledge, the trust and transparency related to the historical events, fears about pharma that circulates in the social media. And most importantly, there's not enough data for us to be able to say one way or another that this vaccine is completely safe or not. I would say and reemphasize the fact that these vaccines are still under emergency use agreement uh, authorization. So it is not something that has been really tested for a long period of time. And the lack of data really creates a barrier for us to be able to get this very important vaccination process into our dialysis units more effectively. I also would like to mention a couple of missed opportunities to increase the chance of vaccine allocation for dialysis patients. I think uh, it is wonderful that we have access to the vaccine, but we should learn from our experiences. We should have, I think, identified our patients who qualified for earlier phases. As you all know, the initial part of the, the initial criteria for vaccination was elderly. And it turns out that almost a quarter, almost a third of our dialysis patients would have qualified for this criteria. Unfortunately, at least for my own dialysis unit, I would say we did not have the logistics to be able to identify those, those individuals. We didn't do a survey. We didn't really assess the immediate need and determine how to obtain access to those individuals at the beginning of the vaccination. I would say uh, we were unfortunately ineffective in terms of our advocacy uh, for the higher risk allocation. And that is something that needs to happen for the future. That is, we need to find ways and be able to express the need for these patients in a much more effective way. And another thing that needs to happen is that we've learned that we need to educate the staff and the patient to be able to have more access and acceptance of the vaccine. What about the efficacy of the vaccine? Well, the first information that we need to know is that whether the vaccine is effective in the real life. We know that it's effective in healthy individuals in the clinical trials. I'm just gonna show you one data set that was published about a week ago or so that shows the efficacy of the vaccine at one medical center. If you can just sort of focus on these bars here, the first bar shows the employees that are not vaccinated and the rate of infections. The second bar shows the partially vaccinated employees, and the third one on the very right shows the fully vaccinated. And you can easily see the unbelievable effectiveness of the vaccine if fully uh, uh, administered to the individuals. So this clearly indicates that the vaccine is very effective in real life as well. What about patients with kidney disease? Well, uh, there are a couple of questions that needs to be answered. One of them is the data and then the efficacy of different dosing with uh, administrations. This is really important in terms of the single dose versus double dose because in low resource environments, one can actually argue that rather than having two dosing of the mRNA vaccines that have been published, a single dose might be more effective in terms of achieving the herd immunity or general immunity. Now, we also need to know how to really uh, follow these patients, how to understand that immunogenicity. And again, the way we do that is a little bit more complex than we know in the uh, 
general nephrology community. Of course, what normally people do is monitoring of the antibody response, and that gives us a good idea, and this gives us an immediate understanding of the humoral response. Unfortunately, it does not provide us any data in terms of the long-term immunogenicity as well as, the humor, as well as the cellular response related to T cell memory cells. I'd like to remind you that the way we look at the antibodies is the specific structural proteins of the virus itself. I'm showing you a, a depiction of this specific virus. And most of the antibodies that are really assessing the uh, humoral response are targeted against the nucleocapsid protein or the spike protein. There are other antibodies for the other membrane proteins and structures, but these two are the most commonly uh, reported antibodies. And the reason for them are very important because the spike protein is actually where the virus connects to the cell. So to be able to sort of block that spike, pro spike protein will likely block the connection of this virus to the specific cell that it's trying to infect. The nucleocapsid protein also is important and the membrane protein is also important because those are really great limiting steps in terms of the vaccine to be able to go into the cell itself. I'd like to give you some basics about immunogenicity and it's really important to understand that these are really complex ways of really understanding how the vaccines work or how the disease itself lends its to immunogenicity in terms of durability of this uh, response to the disease. The first thing we do is, as I've mentioned, is look at the humoral response, and this can be assessed by antibodies for the spike protein, receptor binding domain, or the membrane protein. The neutralization assays are really critical in terms of understanding how the virus is not going into the cell itself. That is, if you can do a neutralization assay and assess the amount of inhibition of these development of these uh, virus-related plaques, you can say the vaccine is really being blocked in terms of being effective and in going into the cell and doing what it's supposed to do. And this could be done by pseudovirus or live virus assays, such as focus reduction neutralization assay or plaque reduction neutralization assay. The most important thing that one needs to keep in mind, while these seem to be the gold standard in terms of the humoral response, they're the most time consuming and requires a specific setup, especially for the live virus, because you need to have a higher level of protection to be able to use the virus and do the assay itself. And then of course, you need to look at the cellular response in terms of being able to provide a subsequent durable response to the disease or the vaccine. And these are done by what we call the LI spot. And they're looking at the cytokine response or cyt cytotoxic T cell response after the activation of the single cells by a specific antibody. And these antibodies are the same structural proteins that I've mentioned before. This is an outstanding way of really showing how the efficacy and how the safety and immunogenicity of the mRNA vaccine can be done in a phase two trial. Here, what they're doing is four different assays. One is the regular uh, ELISA, as you can see on the left upper panel. And then they have the pseudovirus neutralization assay focus reduction neutralizing assay, and then PLEC reduction neutralization assay. And here, what they're showing is that in different groups of ages of patients with different doses, how much of this activity you're able to show. And this is the study actually that lended itself to be able to use the 100 microgram dosing in all of the clinical phase three clinical trials. As you can see, the maximal inhibitory capacity of 50% as shown here is very effective at the 100 Milligram, microgram dosing for both pseudovirus as well as the focus reduction and plaque reduction assays. This is another paper that was published about two weeks ago. And it goes, it again shows you the gold standard in terms of these live virus focus reduction neutralization tests. Here, there are three groups of patients and very important data coming out in terms of comparison of these patient populations. Panel A shows the patients who are acutely infected. Panel B, shows plasma that are actually obtained from individuals who had the disease previously. And then panel C shows data that is obtained from patients who are fully vaccinated with mRNA vaccination. And here, what you're really looking at is the focus reduction neutralization assay with different SARS-CoV-2 variants. And just to let you know, A1 is the regular one we see, and this B1.1.17, is actually the UK variant. 
And here, as you can see, there's a significant capability of these individuals who are previously acutely infected to be able to deal with the vaccine. And it's almost the same as compared to the individuals who had previously had the disease. But most importantly, there's a much more robust capability of uh, neutralize the vi uh, viruses, especially these variants in patients who are vaccinated previously. So this is a very promising data that the vaccine is actually very capable in terms of preventing the disease and probably better in terms of preventing the disease than the previous infection. And that's one of the reasons why uh, vaccination is still recommended for individuals who had the disease previously. What about dialysis patients? Let me show you a couple of preliminary data that are coming up. The first information is the natural antibody response to the infection itself. This is a paper that was published back in November of 2020 from eight patients who had disease previously. What they've shown is that over time, these individuals over weeks or months have actually decreased their IgG titers. So this suggested that there was an initial response, but subsequently went down in terms of durability of the immune response. Another paper just came up in uh, Kenya International in February 2021, this time looking at pediatric hemodialysis patients versus 34 healthcare workers. And in this study, the data suggested that after 13 weeks of infection, that is post-infection, the dialysis patients, pediatric albeit, could only maintain a seropositive B rate of 35%. So this is a little bit concerning such that if you had an infection, if you're a pediatric dialysis patient, if you had an infection, in about three to four months, about 60% of the patients do not show any humoral response. But again, there's no data in terms of the cellular response, whether there's some memory that is in the body that will be reactivated. And it's really important to know whether that really exists or not, because that may actually provide an additional and the appropriate response in these individuals. And again, another paper that was published, that will be published uh, by Clark and colleagues at Kinney International. This one looks at the hemodialysis patients, and this one is much more uh, informative and actually uh, optimistic. They've screened 356 patients in their dialysis unit, and they found that 136 actually had a persistence of their antibodies over six months. And in those individuals, they were able to show that there was a really robust immune response, human response that was seen after six months of disease. That is a very promising data set. Now, in addition, in 11 patients, they did not see any response that has been maintained after six months. So they were positive at the beginning of the study, and six months later, these people did not show any seropositivity. They went back and obtained uh, immune cells uh, PBMCs from these individuals to assess T cell response. And it turned out that eight out of 10 actually showed the robust uh, detectable T cell response, indicating that if those individual individuals were to be infected, they would mount a response to the disease itself and likely to have a much uh, milder disease if they had the disease at all. So this is a very prom promising data set in terms of previous infection and then protection for the subsequent infection. Uh, there's another paper that was published in NDT looking at the same information. Here, the data is actually monthly assessment of anti-nuclear protein IgG. They've shown that almost 100% of the patients were actually seropositive by the criteria. And there was an increase in the seropositivity as measured by the optical density, as can be seen here. They also show that there was no difference between diabetic status versus non-diabetic, as well as previous immunosuppression history or not. And then in more detail, Ampton colleagues from Germany have shown that there's a robust T cell response to SARS-2 COVID infection in a select group of maintenance hemodialysis patients, that is 14 hemodialysis patients. Then compared to 14 controls, they were able to show that the anti-nuclear protein IgG response, as well as the T cell response, the LI spot data, was almost identical in those two groups, indicating that dialysis patients are likely to have a very durable response after the infection. What about the vaccine immunogenicity? You will be seeing a number of papers, albeit most of them are preliminary, preliminary in terms of vaccine immunogenicity in dialysis and transplant patients. The first one is uh, by Etias and colleagues from France. 
uh, that shows the humoral response in 69 maintenance hemodialysis patients that were weekly assessed for anti-S IgG titers. The most important data set is can be seen here at the very right side of the figure, almost 80% of the individuals have actually provided a response that is considered to be positive here. So vaccine works in four out of five patients or eight out of 10 in a very robust fashion. And again, if those individuals had a previous infection, they had a much more robust initial response compared to the ones who did not have previous infection. Another important data set or observation here is the fact that, as you can see these weekly assessments, the robust, the positive response actually happens after four to six weeks post the first initial injection and most likely to occur after the second dosing. This clearly hints the fact that these patients are still vulnerable for disease in the first two to four weeks. And if they don't, get a second vaccine, they might have actually maintained this low levels. So this clearly suggests that these individuals need a second dose, a booster dose. A similar data from uh, Agur and colleagues from Israel, uh, data in terms of two to six weeks after the second vaccine dosing, they measured blood samples for anti-spike IgG antibodies, and they've shown that in dialysis patients, there's almost a 95 plus percent seropositivity after three after six weeks of uh, after the second vaccine dose. And this is not any different in terms of being on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Again, a very promising data set suggesting that if you wait six weeks after the second dose, our patients, the ones on dialysis, are very well protected. This is also another data that's actually not published in available internet at MedRx, uh, shows a humoral response, in contrast to the others, these data suggest that there's a little bit of a less antibody titer response in the dialysis patients compared to the controls. Although these data sets have not been peer reviewed at this point, but I think it'll be worthwhile to, to, to show it here. And finally, what about transplant patients? Well, the transplant patient data is very limited. The first data set came from a JAMA publication uh, very recently, Bodarsky and colleagues, showing the immunogenicity in terms of being antibody detectable or undetectable after three, three weeks after the first dosing. Here, as you can see, this is all solid organs. And if you can look at this box here that I've shown you, there are a total of uh, 200, 224, uh, 219 uh, kidney transplant patients, and in this patient population, the seropositivity is pretty low, about 18 to 20% in the transplant patients compared to the uh, controls. So this clearly indicates that transplant patients may not be as protected in the first three weeks after the single dose. And similar data is actually provided by Bernard Money et al., that's going to be published very quick very, uh, in the near future that shows that after the one-time assessment, 28 days after the first vaccination, there's a substantial lack of immunogenicity, about 20% or so at most in kidney transplant recipients. Now, I have to re-emphasize the fact that this is very similar to what we've seen in dialysis patients and possibly very similar to what you would see in general population that the first two to four weeks is very vulnerable. And these patients may not be able to have enough time to really build a robust immune response, at least a humoral response. So we should be waiting for additional data to come after the second vaccination, the second dose administration in kidney transplant patients to be able to say this is really working or not. So finally, in summary, what do we know and what are the pending questions? Well, I can conclusively say that the durability of humoral response after a COVID-19 infection in end-stage kidney disease patients who are on dialysis seems to be encouraging. The chances of reinfection, at least with the same variant of the virus, is pretty low, although we do not know whether this is the same for the variants or not. And again, preliminary but very uh, promising data suggests that there's a robust response to full dosing of mRNA vaccination. And this is almost identical to the general population. Now, if you were to go back and look at the single dose uh, mRNA vaccination, uh, 
that seems to be inadequate in terms of both dialysis and kidney transplant patients. Again, close to what you would see in the general population and really means that these patients should not be put on a single dose vaccination regimen. They have to get a double dosing, at least the way the vaccine have been initially tested and administered in general population. Now, there are also certain questions that we do not know, which we will hopefully in the next couple of months learn. That is the duration of the response, whether the disease is protected or there's a vaccine efficacy, which is different than actual immune response. And then how these data actually correlate in terms of a prolonged immune response in our patient population. With that, I'll stop and thank you very much for your time and be happy to answer any questions.